I'm Betsy Rosenberg, back with you on Green TV. I always say that we get the best people, and I know it sounds like an exaggeration, but I do. I'll take credit. And why is that? Because I've been reporting on the green scene for so many years that over the course of that time, I've gotten to know the people who are in the forefront of all kinds of interesting things, and not just the usual suspects and not just the usual subjects. My guest today is a perfect example of that. Some of you may know about the idling problem, and I have noticed it over the years, all these cars, especially now in Texas, people want to sit there, you know, air conditioned in their car or their truck, a lot of big cars and trucks there, and they're sitting there for minutes and, and longer. Um, but it was the streets of New York that got this um, citizen to become an activist. This person I'm talking about is one of my heroes, George Packenham. And uh, he's going to tell you his story. It's fascinating. It started quite a few years ago. It was inspired by a couple of events, and he has changed the landscape in terms of um, how things work with cars that are idling. And that was illegal, but who knew and who enforced it? Well, now it's a thing. It's a real thing with some teeth. Thanks for joining me, George. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you. That was, a, that was a beautiful introduction. I appreciate it. Well, and I, I appreciate people like you because I, you know, being green, I, I get irked by so many things from straws to idling to, you know, you, you can name it, you can imagine. Um, and I want to do something about it. And you did something about it. And it's so inspiring. And it's something that should be replicated across the country. And I hope will be. And maybe with all your recognition, that's in the process of, of happening. So take us back to, I think you, if, as I recall, you were on your lunch break, you worked in the financial district, and you started noticing some things. Well, I'm going to take you back to 2006. That's a real long time ago. And it, indeed, right about that period of time, I began to notice the trucks and buses and limos and automobiles at curbside in New York, and they were idling their engines and polluting the air. And this was all on the heels of the uh, war in Iraq. And um, if you remember, the, one of the big controversies was we went to war because there were weapons of mass destruction. And that right about that time, it became quite obvious that it was not true, it was bogus. And so I was witnessing my fellow New Yorkers consume oil, burn oil in the form of diesel fuel or gasoline at curbside. And I connected the war and, and the, my, the behavior of my fellow citizens and it really got under my skin. And just at the same time, uh, I was learned that my brother was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He was not a smoker. He lived in New Hampshire the past 10 years of his life. And those were two, you know, very key issues to me that that got under my skin, that festered, and uh, and it went on for weeks. I didn't know what to do, and and then one night coming home from a restaurant with some of my friends, I noticed a stretch limousine, a white stretch limousine, right at the corner of where I live, and and the guy was idling, the driver was idling, the passengers had left the limousine and we were inside the restaurant. So it was empty, the guy had his engine on. And I just sort of tapped my foot a half a dozen times and says, now. <laughs> and so I walked up to the guy, wrapped down his window and I asked him to roll the window down. We had a very pleasant conversation about what he was doing. And at the end I said, well, how about just shutting your engine off? And he goes, oh, sure. And shut his engine off. And that was a, a stellar moment in my life because I realized that I had the power to influence a total stranger and ask him to behave in a way that's more becoming in the city of New York, which I love. I love the city of New York and want only the best for it. So that got me on this path of um, intervening with people, whether it's a passenger car, or a bus, a truck, and asking them to shut their engine off. And coincidentally, about three weeks later, a month later, I did the same thing to another limo driver and the, and the limo driver said, get, get away from me. I'm an undercover cop and I'm on duty. So go away. <laughs> I said, by all means. So I walked 10 feet away, Betsy. And he goes, get back here. I go, oh man, I'm in trouble now. And I turn around, come back. And he goes, you know, you have something here because it's against the law to idle your engine. I went, what? It's against the law. He goes, yeah, I don't know much about the law, but if you're interested, pursue it, figure it out, find out what's going on. So that was like another, you know, cavalcade moment to say, let's push this thing forward. It led me into research who, when the law was established in 19, in 1971, at that point in time, 40 years before, you know, 
Who knew? So like, this law is not being enforced. And it wasn't being enforced. So I was the enforcer, so to speak. <laughs> I got a little business card and uh, had the law on one side and the penalties associated with the law on the other. And when I approach people, I'd wrap in the window and then say, um, you might not know this, but in the city of New York, it's against the law to keep your engine idling. And then they'd, I'd pause and they'd be going like, who the hell is this guy? And then I'd explain about the law and give them a card and ask them to shut their engine off and learn that I was 80% successful doing this because I, I kept a, a Excel spreadsheet of everyone I approached. So this was sort of extreme behavior, but I was onto something and I'm 80% successful. And did you get hit in the 20% of the cases where they weren't so happy to hear from you? <laughs> I mean, uh, any, any, anything close to scary because uh, sometimes well, there were, there were interesting comments, Betsy. And in my Excel spreadsheet, I kept a column of the comments that people made. <laughs> and some of them were quite wry, but not, you know, I got the F-bomb uh, oh, a dozen times or so. You can take it. You can take but it. Yeah. They were unusual comments. I kept the spreadsheet of the comments. And it was, looking back now, it's rather amusing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I kept marching ahead. And I kept on the focus of what this is all about and did a demo to a documentary on this and worked a couple of months to refine it and then started to present it to people in government and at nonprofits about what this whole thing was about. And um, ultimately it took months. I finally sat, sat down with the Environmental Defense Fund folks, the lawyer and the public health advocate there. And they loved the demo and said, let's work together. So that started this union between the Environmental Defense Fund, which is a robust organization, and my street activity. We pushed ahead. One thing led to another. In 2009, Mr. Bloomberg, our mayor, signed a bill saying no more idling for more than a minute in a school zone. So it's the first time the law had been addressed since 1971. Oh, those buses, they idle, oh. you know, spewing black exhaust right at the level of the kids' faces. Yeah. So that was, a, you know, that was relatively easy. And then I finished the documentary film. It's called Idle Threat, Man on Emission. <laughs> get it? On emission. I'm, a, I'm a woman on emission to get more <laughs> green environmental news and mainstream media. So no wonder we like each other. <laughs> yeah. So I finished the film and had the world premiere at the Woodstock Film Festival, which was just terrific. The executive director thought it was the one film not to miss out of the entire festival. That was 2012. I've About seen it. Yeah, we're going to put a link up to it, by the way, because it's a great film. Go ahead. Yeah. About a year and a half later, I was summoned to city council to discuss the nuance of the idling law. And at that time, I had a DVD of the film and saw a very approachable leader on city council, uh, a lawyer. And after my testimony, I went up and gave this person a copy of the DVD. I said, here's the, here's the movie. It explains the whole situation. The next week, we're emailing back and forth. We say, let's have coffee. We sit and have coffee. First thing out of her mouth is, great movie, loves it. It's time for a citizen enforcement component to the law. A citizen, I said, what does that mean? She goes, well, I think it would be a $350 fine when the citizen gets half. I went, how would that happen? And she says, you have to go back to your, your local council person, work within the framework of government, Create, have her create the bill and the bill gets presented and passed. So ultimately I sat with Helen Rosenthal who is a terrific advocate on many levels. She's on the Upper West Side. I uh, had a 12 page PowerPoint for her Betsy and she's going through page one, page two, page three, page four. She goes, you had me at page one. I know what <laughs> I need to do. I know what I need to do to make this happen. And um, uh, six months later on the steps of City Hall, Bill 717A was presented and the media went crazy. You know, what's this all about? How can citizens do this? This is impossible. It's a boondoggle. And three years after that, Bill 717A was passed by City Council by a vote of 40, 47 to 3. Wow. To allow citizens to enforce the law that the, the police ignored if not shunned and uh it was not 50 percent bounty it was a 25 percent bounty on a 350 dollar fine still it's real money especially uh, it's for people who are money. hurt by this people like us yeah 
And here are the statistics raw. Uh, just starting out in 2018, about 1,200 uh, uh, fines, or I should say about 1,200 submissions were placed before the Department of Environmental Protection. Most of them were paper types of uh, submissions. And <clears throat> the next year there were, in 2019, there were 9,600 wow. files presented to DP and almost the same, a little bit more the same the following year in 2020. In 2019, 2020, $1.5 million of revenue was raised by the city and this participating citizens got 25%. And, and cleaner air. And, and, and cleaner air and attention to the law that, that now has been around 50 years. And so, they save gas, so they save money too. Save gas, save money, and it's just, it's a, you know, Betsy, it's a public health issue. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's, Absolutely. yeah, it's an it's a enforcement issue, but it's really a public health issue. Everyone benefits by people behaving in a proper eco manner. And this is, uh, to my knowledge, New York is the only city that has this type of law where citizens can partake in it and be, and be uh, financially rewarded for their activity. Is there any reason that couldn't be spread to other cities? Because it seems like such a win-win-win. And you've already done the groundwork. You've done the heavy lifting. And, and walk us through the process. I, I hear that there's a time limit, like they can idle for a minute, but not more than five. And I, I think you said that you have to um, record the idling, the person who's going to give the citation and send it in. Yeah, the only thing, only thing you need is your cell phone. So, and, and an app called a timestamp. So the timestamp app, allows you to make an accurate recording of up to and beyond three minutes, generally speaking, and beyond one minute, generally speaking, in a school zone. So that's all the time you have to spend uh, uh, videotaping the, say, say for instance, it's a, a truck or a bus at this point in time. Passenger cars are not part of the law. Uh, limos are not part of the law. It's trucks and buses. So you have to spend one minute plus the school zone, three minutes plus otherwise to capture, basically it's the sound they want in court, the sound of the engine purring. Um, and you have to be sort of clever and stay in the blind spot, so to speak, so you're not so obvious to the driver or the passenger. Have there been altercations? Um, Nothing serious, me, I hope. Me personally, I, I have walked away from any sort of potential uh, altercation, although some of my colleagues, and now there's about 2,000 of us doing this. So my colleagues have been chased, you know, uh, how dare you do that? But, um, you know, for the most part, people are, I mean, the, the 2,000 people that do it are smart enough to stay hidden and to capture what they need to capture and then walk on to the next one. Um, there's, there's some people that do it with such uh, earnest that they'll make $100,000 in a year, believe it or not. Amazing, and how are people hearing about this? Well, the media has been still focusing on this thing ever since it exploded initially years ago. Such a good story. <laughs> it, it, yeah, um, uh, about two years ago, Vice TV, which is part of HBO, did a really interesting piece on this whole thing. Um, and it, they had 4 million views on their, on their um, YouTube site, which was amazing. Uh, but a very interesting thing happened just weeks before COVID hit in New York City. Uh, Mayor de Blasio had Billy Idol Day. And he announced <laughs> Billy Idol as the 1980s rocker icon as the spokesperson for not idling your car. Clever. It, it made a huge splash and everyone got excited about it. And then three weeks later, COVID hit and the city shut down and, you know, it's just been very strange ever since. However, the courts have stayed open and they, they work with Zoom to prosecute and adjudicate these types of files. So the court hasn't slowed down at all, uh, even though a lot of the mechanisms and a lot of the, the focus on this diminished once COVID came. It, it took all the stories. Um, but, but there's uh, traffic back in the streets of New York now. Double yeah. parking, idling. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's back. And just just recently, Bloomberg did a, a, a marvelous in-depth story on this that appeared about six weeks ago. Um, and I was very fortunate indeed just two weeks ago to be interviewed 
by Humans of New York, which if you haven't heard about that, it's really a remarkable site. Uh, Brendan Stanton, the uh, executive director, interviews New Yorkers that are doing things that are unusual or exciting or special. Just that, like this. Yeah, that the other media wouldn't catch. Right. And then he creates a little, little uh, composition uh, and it goes on Instagram and Facebook and such. And, uh, you know, the result of that has been enormous uh, flash of this whole issue. That's it's great. very fortunate. You are an exemplary human of New York, and I want you to become the standard bearer and the uh, model for other cities because it, it you've proven it works. And we have clearly, we have a problem with pollution, which kills more people than COVID has and will. Yeah. Uh, climate, obviously, and uh, emissions. You're a man on emission. I'm a woman on emission. Are going to do us in? Are going to cook the planet if we don't wake up and smell the carbon? And we have a lot of turning around to do in less than a decade. Cut our emissions in half. This is one of those ways. It may seem like a small thing, but you know, there's no reason to idle. Really. What about the instances? Because you do have, you know, cold winters here and hot summers where people say they're they have to to stay warm while they're waiting for their family member or something, or they have to keep the air conditioning on because that's the only thing that I could see could be justifiable, but not for too long in my view, but what's theirs? Yeah, yeah so in, as the law has been written, if it's below 40 degrees, certain buses can get exempt from yeah. this because they have children on it, et cetera. But other than that, there are, there isn't, are no exemptions for whether it's too cold or too hot. Um, and Good. you know, all it takes, is this to shut the engine off and to, oh, if it's too darn warm, open up your window and get a little breeze, you know? Right. If it's, if it's too cold, just keep the heater on for a long time and then shut it off. And I'm really interested in the fact that you get mostly a positive response. I've done the same thing. I'm like you, I've got a green gene and so many things, you know, bother me that are wasteful, right? Um, because if we're not gonna go out to the low hanging fruit, how are we gonna do the big stuff? For instance, um, I, I'm being a woman, I think it's usually too cold in public like buildings like a hotel or something or a movie theater. And it's like frigid. It's like walking inside a you know restaurant freezer. And I've said something like, why is it 60 degrees in this hallway? You know, it was happened to be a chain hotel in Dallas. And when I speak up, almost always they they thank me, just like you, the experience you had. And I say, I just don't know why you're, you're wasting energy. We do have a climate crisis and they they nod like, yeah, they've heard of that. And I said, and it's just uncomfortable. And so if you say it politely and if you connect the dots for them, um, and, and, and most of the time it's almost like, well, we've just sort of, or sort of always, always done it this way. We, I don't even know why we've got the air conditioning blasting in March. You know, um, There was another instance where I was with my daughter at a motel in uh, Purchase, New York, and they had a fireplace going. It was July, it was 85 degrees, middle of the day. And I said, why do you have a fireplace going, you know, in July. Oh, it's ambiance. I said, ambiance? Really? I said, do me a favor. We, we had to be there for a week because my it was the swine 09. My daughter got swine flu at oh. camp. So I had to take her out and we were isolated. And so I, I said, for just a week while we're here, could you not turn the fire on and just let me know how many complaints you get? So sure enough, when we checked out, no complaints. You know? And yeah, so I want people who are listening to be ambassadors. We all need to speak up you know, because it's not any one person's job. I mean, even the people whose job it is to give tickets for idling were not able to do it. They probably feel like they have much more important things to do. So that's why I love, you know, what you've done. It's just like such an example of what we need to see more of because this is all of our concern. You can't just leave it up to the Sierra Club to solve the environmental problems. Well, well there's an interesting twist that has developed in the past year or so. There, there's roughly 2000 people in the city of New York that submit evidence to the DEP. And of that, we, we've created a subset as about 40 of us. The, the name of the group is Idle Warriors, which is a little bit corny. I like but it. Nevertheless, That's we're like set up as almost like a guild, Betsy, where we share information, we share nuance of this whole thing. And we're now a political force to apply pressure to the DEP and the court system when things shouldn't, when things aren't running the way they should be running. And, um, you know, it's been an interesting um, organizational activity to see the cream rise up and say, we want, not only do we want to participate, but we want a voice. And so uh, it might be an interesting little reminder for folks in the 40 or 50 of the biggest cities in America that you can, you can form these little guilds and have political power. 
So if people are listening, watching, and they want to try this in their city, they can contact you, right? Are you, um, are you offering like a kit, a starter kit, how to do it? I, I have a welcome package. <laughs> Fact, you do. <laughs> so if, they're, if they want to reach out to me, do it at george at verdanza.org, V-E-R-D-A-N-S-A.org, and I'll, res I'll respond. We'll put the links up and also the link to the film. And um, I, what has this taught you? Obviously, the obvious takeaway is one person can make a difference. That's a cliche, but you've certainly exemplified that. Uh, but what else has this done for your life and just a sense of satisfaction rather than frustration? Well, you know, the, 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 the folks in the, the guild, the 40 people that have joined the guild, um, that, there's a lot of satisfaction there because most of them are practitioners of a higher level on this thing than I am. They've, they've exceeded what I've done. So I, I'm in the, in the foreground, but these guys in the background are better producers. Idling 2.0. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that's an interesting little facet. Interesting. Um, you know, it, it, in my imagination, going back 2006, to think that this would evolve into what it has was a far-fetched, it didn't exist. Mm -hmm. It didn't exist as a thought. Mm -hmm. And to see what's what's happened and to see the potential in other cities, I mean, that's a real a viable uh, potential. I know Philadelphia is looking at this, by the way. Well, I want Green TV to start a feature called Waste Watchers and people like you would get an award um, for watching waste and, uh, wait, and then have a one for people who are very wasteful or places. and. Shame them. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, it's um, it's something we need to do more. You know, we don't have a, a good sense of environmental stewardship in this country. We're more, you know, we can do whatever you want. Look what's going on with masks. I don't have to wear a mask. I don't have to get a vaccine. We need to do. Oh, here's what I would like to see you do next. <laughs> Go after, you know, gas guzzlers. I like you said after Iraq, um, you, it was bothering you that we were, you know, going there fighting for oil presumably, and uh, people are wasting oil. And yeah. the same thing happened for me. Um, a couple of moms and I started a campaign called Don't Be Fueled, a gas roots, G-A-S, gas roots campaign, trying to educate moms about the need for safer, meaning more clean, efficient SUVs um, and vans, and also get signatures to give to the big three automakers to say, build them and they will buy them. We were way ahead of our time like you were too. But the point is, that needs to be socially unacceptable too. You know, all the wasted emissions that come out of just usually driving one person around in a, you know, automobile. And, and that needs to become socially unacceptable too. I live in Texas and there's a lot of big cars and pickup trucks. So yeah. in California, you know, a little better, but like, it's the same thing though, right? It's the same thing with COVID. Personal choices have public impact. Yeah, yeah. Especially down the road, so to speak. So you want to take that on or someone else? <laughs> How, um, we, we can caucus about that. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about that. We, we'll start a little activist campaign here. Well, that's really what I do these you know, interviews for, these programs for is to show good examples and to amplify and scale up because there should be programming on you know, news networks, as I've been saying, because this is the most important story. These are existential threats we face and things are happening, as you know, faster than even the scientists had predicted. So if uh, the mainstream media doesn't think this is worth airtime, we do, right? Because what's what's more important? So I really applaud you for your, your efforts and hanging in there this long. And I just want to share your story, you know, far and wide and, and loudly. Thank, Thank you, Betsy. Thank you very much. I, I, I love what you're doing as sort of like the, you know, the the pusher of this whole thing out in a mass way. It's great. You're doing a good job. Thank you. I mean, I've always wanted to be a conduit between all the environmental experts that I would interview at conferences from zero waste to zero emissions. I mean, over many, many years, I'd have my little cassette recorder and I'd get all these great quotes from speakers and put it on the air, CBS at that time in San Francisco. And I said, these concepts and these issues are too urgent and compelling. And these people are too wise to not share, you know, the wisdom really. And I just, that's all I've been trying to do is be that bridge because it's almost these 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 things are so important. They're so urgent, 
and it's been in the confines of you know environmental professionals, recycling professionals, you know it's in the, the grassroots organizations. But the public needs to know about this. And we would, if we had a more eco savvy public, because we do have an eco literacy problem, we would have more people pushing for greener policies, and we would never allow what I call a dinosaur anywhere near the White House. And look what happens when people are not educated and the dots are not connected. And then you have environmental rollbacks and it's just when we can least least uh, afford it. So thanks for my, my, that's my little rant about this, that yeah, we all need to speak up. It's for all of our children and grandchildren and beyond. Um, but even we are, I mean, I, I'm from California, friends who lost their homes. Uh, we were in Texas during this snow apocalypse in February. It was harrowing, harrowing, deep freeze snow. It, it did change a few neighbors' minds. Some of my Republican neighbors then started talking about how this must be climate change. But if we're gonna wait till mother nature just almost obliterates <laughs> life on earth, it'll be a little bit too late. And of course it is late. So thank you for being an early adopter on something that has bothered me a long time. And I really hope other cities take this up, any, any municipalities really. So. You get you get the award. So far, we've been on Green TV about a month doing interviews. You're you're the best so far. So we'll figure out a name for it. We'll get you something. It'll be environmentally friendly for sure. It won't be plastic. <laughs> your trophy. <laughs> you're a, you're a champion. That's a you're a champion. Thank you. Go forth and greenify, and we'll stay in touch with you and see what you've done. You know, in the next year, I, I have high hopes. High hopes. Thanks, George. Bye bye now. And, that does it for this edition of Green TV. Tell your friends about us because we need more listeners to bring you more content. I promise you there's no shortage of stories and problems and solutions and solutionaries. Uh, so as soon as we get a few more viewers, we can get some sponsors, we can get more content on. We're aiming to be 24 seven. We wanna be GNN, just like we can turn on CNN anytime and see people talking live about news. Well, here we will do environmental news. And I promise you there's at least enough for 24 seven and then some. See you next time.